uh, Henry MacDonald at uh, the last event of the Fila in the Falls Road Library. So we're just going to have a chat about your book, where you got the inspiration, and some of the some of the more interesting facts you found out in this journey, and and also how the book progressed okay. um, from the start of it until if it changed much by the end of it. Well, basically, the book was inspired by Blackstaff, my publisher here, uh, and Colourpoint Blackstaff, and that they came up with the idea for a photo essay of the life of Martin McInnes. And what they, they approached me to write the text to give it historical context, shape, balance, and all that. And uh, in actual fact, at the time last summer, I was in the middle of writing something completely different. I was actually writing the second draft of a novel. So this became the great disrupting, disruptor of my uh, novel writing, so I'm back to that again now. Uh, and in a kind of strange way, this book is perhaps, never say never, but probably my last non-fiction work about Northern Ireland affairs, Irish affairs. Okay? I've written quite a few books, both in Parliament and my first book was actually about, it was 25 years ago, it was about the uh, writing a about the Irish army in Lebanon, where I spent a, a considerable period of time. But, uh, but this, in many ways, could be the, the stop point, because I'm moving out of Ireland eventually, uh, I hope, and uh, I'm moving out of the Post of Ireland correspondent for the Guardian and the Observer. Uh, the pastures new. Don't know where those pastures are exactly yet, but we will find out. So in many ways, this was kind of relevant, the, that kind of evolution. So really, the team at Blackstaff, please enlighten the folks more yeah, well, on that. I, I suppose, I suppose when, when Martin McGinnis passed away, I think that we had a sense, I think a lot of people had a sense that it was the end of an era and a real sort of a moment to pause in a way and um, I suppose we're a commercial business as well and we thought that maybe there was a yeah, it, there was a market for a book on Martin McGuinness and something that would yeah just mark an extraordinary life and an extraordinary moment in Northern Ireland history um, and we thought the time to do it was, well, you know, we thought that was the time to do it. And so we decided that the best way to approach it, there were lots of extraordinary images of Martin McGuinness and that that might be one way of approaching it. Um, we wanted to go for something that was a photographic record, um, that was factual. And, you know, once we decided on that kind of approach to the subject, then it was a case of looking for someone who would be able to write um, write about those events across that whole span of Mark's life, write about, write about him within those events and within that context as it unfolded. And that is when, that was how we initially approached Henry. Um, and that, that's where, that was the sort of genesis of the, of the idea. The other uh, thing that is different from this book from anything I've ever written before was obviously, it's, it seems obvious, it's picture-led. And in many ways it brought me back to my days as a broadcaster. Now I've crossed the, I mean, the, the dividing wall between print and electronic media is gone because of the internet, but there used to be a very kind of firm Chinese wall between the two and when you... You had to climb over it to get to get the one side or the other, and on the broadcasting side of the wall, the the golden rule, where they teach you in places like the BBC and their training academy, would be that words are secondary, pictures are paramount, script to pictures, right? So you write what you see, what the, the viewer will see. Uh, I know it sounds obvious, but for people who are brought up writing all the time, getting out of that mentality it, it is, a, is a big mental switch. And the thing about this book was that there were so many dominant and arresting imagery, images in it that you were constantly thinking, script the picture, script the picture, script the picture. So you write what you see. And, you know, to the credit of 
the black staff team that assembled the photographs. They did a great job in terms of the sequential thread that run through the images, which of course are also part of the history of photography because you've got very grainy black and white photographs from the early troubles, right to the kind of the, you know, the kind of the, look, the enemies like that, you know, tacky, tacky color emblazoned, you know, kind of it's, the, the contrast between the actual prints uh, from the early days to the latter times almost reflects not the evolution of photography, obviously, but also I think they reflect the, from darker times to brighter times, if you like. Uh, so you, ha yeah, you had to reflect that in the writing too. The other thing is that you would spot little images that maybe, you know, people wouldn't get on first glance that were significant, you know? Whether it was the cricket bats, Paisley and Martin jousting with the cricket bats or certain individuals who crop up beside him who play significant roles in Irish Republican history in modern times. So, but always script the pictures. It was like a form of a broadcasting script as much as a text to wrap around imagery. Most news writing, news, the, the photograph that accompanies a news story, whether it's in a newspaper or more commonly these days in, a, in, in an online edition of a newspaper, whether it's the Irish News, Irish Times, Guardian or whatever, um, the pictures there to complement the story, to give it a bit of weight and maybe to attract the eye of the reader to, you know, to, to click on, on, to click on your story, click, click bit if you like. But an exercise like this, the pictures are paramount, right? And that's what's important. And those air, I think you're, I mean, we refer to, like, a lot of those um, early pictures, but some of them are not, they're not, actually, they're not, some of them are not brilliant quality, but it doesn't, it, you know, it doesn't matter. You can live with that with an older photograph, because the important thing is, you know, as you say, that was the way photography was at the time. I think we were very conscious, you know, some of the challenges in picking out those photographs, the photographs from the early period, you know, they're terrific actually, there's loads of great, I mean there's great portraits of Martin, doesn't matter whether you're early or late in that book actually, like he was incredibly photogenic and you can see that in a lot of the, you know, whether it's the early black and white portraits yeah. or whether it's the kind of, the, I say later shots, but I, we were very struck, I know you were too, that in a lot of the early photographs there is, like, if you look at Martin McGuinness, he, there's a, he's very stern. He is very, very, um, yeah, there's a lot of tension there. By the time you're getting to the end of the book, and I know some of those shots are, I know some of them are press shots, but there's a different feel entirely about the man. Isn't that, like, I felt that going through that. I don't, did you? I, I, the photography, it, it's, it becomes obvious when you, 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 if you study the pictures for so long, as I had to do, to go through them, go through the sequences. You know, you see someone who, you see evolution, obviously, you see a change in someone's life outlook and so on. But uh, yeah, there is that kind of relaxation towards the end, and you can see someone that's, you know, happier in themselves. I don't know. Who knows? Who knows in a life, you know? But I mean, the, it's also, the, the, it's also, uh, some of, the, some of the early images are very, very similar to political imagery across the planet. Like, I, this one here struck me, and I, I don't, you remember I wrote this, so you were kind of surprised. This image here, I was struck at how similar, it reminded me of someone famous yep. in Europe. <clears throat> and I thought, and the reason I have a personal connection actually, because my cousin interviewed him in Paris in 1968, uh, Danny Cohen Bandit, the leader, one of the student leaders of the uprising in Paris. I thought it was, it was kind of a, it was a kind of a odd kind of parallel in the image. Now, it's my, a cousin of mine who became a freelance for the Observer, the Sunday News, ended up in Her Majesty's pleasure and ruined his, uh, ruined his journalistic career among other things. But uh, it just, that, it, it kind of had a kind of a, 
not an Irish feel about it at all. It was kind of a European feel about it. I don't know what that is. I, I could have been a student leader. Because he's very young, you know? You forget the ages of these people. Whatever your political perspective, wherever you come from, you think of how young people were leading from the front, whatever side they were on, you know? Yeah. Talk about a teenage rampage, that song from the 70s, me, you know? But it, it struck me it had a kind of, that, that could have been some bit one of the swaz on we dars, you know? But if, we, if you take it out of an Irish context, you know? You know? And that playing with that kind of stuff was quite interesting, you know? Sort of, you know? Uh, and the kind of the, the historical context of it, obviously, you had to build it in and make sure that there's no specific Irish story. You know? Okay. Sorry, you want to no, no. Interject there. I'm just enjoying this. Yeah. Life. I think the jumper's quite Irish, though. Yes. <laughs> well, no, I mean, you do see the kind of the. No, you did back in the day. The, the, the trendy Parisians in these two. I think the older photos. It's just it's how they're meant to be. It's how you remember them anyway. And when you see that they look faded and dated. And they're, but they're from working class areas usually, and they're from battle torn areas, so they just seem to fit. And any photos we, we had another book on the other day about nostalgia and looking back. And it's the same thing; they all just work because it's of that of the time. And then now, of course, and it, and then again, it does progress his, his whole life from. It's, and it's also coverage of media, how the media changed. But then again, his his life he rose up through media. His media improved as well. But what, what, what did you, what struck you? What did, did you find out anything particular when you had to research it or get into it that struck you that you'd maybe remember differently or had different memories of it when you looked into it again, you know, anything like that? I just, you know, I, I, I remember... Or surprises, you know, something that surprised you looking over it again? Nothing really surprised me. It was more kind of the high... What a different world it was. I mean, you look at that image there... That's Patsy O'Hara's funeral in 1981 in Derry. Okay, now he would have been in a politically opposed to Martin McGuinness, right? And I make that point in the piece very clearly. Yeah, that was an important bit of historical context to put in. They, they were not, they were allies in, in the H block struggles and the hunger strike, but not politically. But if you look, look, I mean, look, look it's a wasteland, you know? You've got loads of these wasteland shots. You think the geography. Not just the people, but the how, what a different world it seems. I mean, it's 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 you forget sometimes how much has changed. So I mean, the, some of the pictures, the background of the pictures, mm -hmm. as well as the subject and and in, in, yep. in the main the part of the image, then, the context of the give you an idea of what a God, what a different world it was. You know, Lord. Um, yeah, I. I, I Many of these images I remember. I mean, I remember being at some of these events, more the latter ones. But uh, there were an awful lot of funerals. I mean, remember we remarked on that. We said there were. Just a an and, and it was a challenge because, in, a, in you know, in terms of the pictures, you probably you don't really. I, I was going to say that that was the time, and that that was those were the events, and that it was difficult times. But even in, ter in terms of having producing a book, you know, having funeral after, uh, do you know, so it's the, those were some of the challenges. But I mean, yeah. And how how many do you put in? Do you overload it, and then you and you also it also underlined the one of the basic things about propaganda and politics and and the transmission of a message. The funeral was such an important event. Could be. Hence so many of them and hence the kind of the the staging of it. Uh, some of the pictures from the uh, from Milltown as well were quite this one here is very harrowing. Oh. Yeah. At the graveside. You know? At the Milltown attack. I mean we've had Michael Stone in the news over the last 24 hours, mm -hmm. and it just brings you back, you know, that, that image there, you know. Um, so, yeah, we, our, our lives, all our lives, not just the lives of the political actors like Martin McGuinness, were kind of coloured and do dominated lots of times by funerals. You know, isn't that good? We don't have to do that anymore, I have to, I have to I'll be subjected to it. Um, but, you know, sorry Richard. Harry, I haven't seen it yet, it, but does it cover... Martin's transition from being a revolutionary to a constitutional politician.
without question. You don't even need. You almost don't even need to read the text. Although, please do <laughs> <laughs> to, to see that happening. You can see the You can see it in the imagery. You know. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, that that happens constantly throughout the political world, particularly the democratic world. I mean, it happens. I mean, it, it's it happened in Spain. It happened in other parts of the world. You know, Joska Fischer used to hang around with the. Uh, the Bader Meinhof in the in the seventies, he ends up as the Green Party foreign minister in in a, in a government. You know these things happen, but yeah, I mean, as I say, the imagery alone, you can see the the, the journey. Yeah, there's no question about that. Definitely, you know, and it, even if you don't if you don't even apply value judgments, you can see it. You know, it's clear. Uh, it, it becomes and it becomes more clear as time goes on. You know, and uh, but it and then you still see. Things punctuated reminders of the past and that, but it uh, it it's funny. It, it goes from funerals to negotiations and meetings. There are lots and lots of images of people walking out of doors, whether it's Downing Street or <laughs> yep. castle buildings. Not necessarily storming out, but there are loads of them, you know. And uh, but some of the best pictures are actually the kind of the, the human ones. I mean, that I mean, you can make a million captions out of that. <laughs> I mean, why that never got onto the front page of Private Eye, yeah. I will not know. You know, the cricket bats. You know, now there's all kinds of. You know, t- take your pick, write your caption. You know, it would make a good competition, wouldn't it? <laughs> but that's actually one of my favourite pictures in the book. But but yes, the the the, the theme is clearly the, the journey and the away from. Armed interaction to constitutional, democratic. Some people would say bourgeois democratic. It's up to them. Liberal politics. I mean, that's it's obvious, you know. But again, I mean, hope, but do read the text as well as the pictures. Do yourself a bit of a job. Yeah. It would be terrible. Yeah. But the, well, it's, I suppose it reflects our journey yeah. of the whole country. It does. And then how it became a bit more. Yeah, like that picture, a bit more lighthearted. It was all very tense and serious, continuously, obviously, but it had the lighthearted moments. Mm-hmm. Although I did say, I did make the there. point that in that cricket analogy, you know, I did. Then the next page is Brian Keenan's funeral, and he once said, "Don't don't trust the English. They invented cricket. They played a long game." And I deliberately chose to juxtapose. The image of the cricket bats with the burial of Brian Keenan because he had warned about the the English long game, you know, which they play quite well. I think we can all agree on that, you know. Maybe not at the minute. Maybe at Lords today they mightn't, but you know, I'm talking about the <laughs> the other game, not the, not the not the one with the willow and the the, yeah. the cork. You know? Politically, you know? we do quite well. Go ahead. Anyone else? Hold on. Can I ask about your process for writing the text? I assume that you interviewed Martin McGuinness personally over the years, or yeah, yeah, you look, relied upon your own recollection? I did, but, yeah. Um, yeah. What, other, what other research did you do? Or? Just the, the, the biography by Kathy Johnson and Liam Clark was invaluable, very good. Great journalist who's, who's now no longer with us. Liam, and uh, just, I had. Files and files and files. I mean, you, you know, over the years, you keep voluminous files on every politician under the sun. Um, it, it's 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 maybe not a secret, but every journalist who's covered, who has a bailiwick to cover, whether it's Jerusalem or Belfast, or you'll also have your obit file. You know, and uh, some people who are alive. Uh, I've got their obit files written, you know, and they're because some, you know. But, I mean, I, my last encounter with him was in uh, Dublin Castle in 2012. And he actually, in fairness, and I, uh, it was a time of the shootings in Derry, all those, yeah, <laughs> probably actually against drugs, the shootings. But after the Andrew Allen murder, and he was speaking at a conference at the Organisation for Security and Cooperation in Europe. It's a bit of a mouthful. And he was there, and I basically doorstepped him. I didn't didn't go through any of the the, the, the usual channels. I went, what the hell, will turn up? Because I might get turned away, you know. Some, something I've written previously that, they, that they, you know, the PR guys didn't like. And I asked him about Rod, and he actually gave a very good interview. 
very strong sound bites denouncing what was going on in Derry in 2012, 2013, whatever it was. It was and I used that, I actually used the, 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 the the sequence, it was shot on a mobile phone. I used the sequence that I shot at the conference in Dublin Castle as part of the documentary I made. Well, we made a kind of mini documentary on it too. That's the last time we did the interview, an interview with him, you know. But fairly accommodating, you know, fairly easier than mo uh, some politicians. Uh, a lot of Republicans are very uh, controlling, talking to the media. DUP are very similar, by the way, very, very similar. Uh, the same kind of heavy control of uh, who their people talk to. Although in private, that's a different story. They'll tell you a different, you know. If you, you know. Uh, but he was one of the easier ones, more approachable, you know. So all that fed into the mix, you know, that kind of experience over the years. You know. But mainly it was more kind of eagle eye view. You know, it was more standing back and looking at a career and an evolution and the journey and all that, you know, being able to stand back at that. And of course, the brilliant way the thing was assembled by the team at Blackstaff, in terms of the photographic sequences, made that a lot easier to do. A lot easier, you know. But I hope it was balanced, I hope it was, it was historically grounded, correct, and, uh, <coughs> and I, I do think it reflects the, the, the pictorial content the way it goes, I think the two complement each other, hopefully. But I mean, back to the book. I mean, it. it, uh, it that this one, just just because it is coming up, we, we all know where that is. I mean, okay, I mean, what what's time is, you know, Patoma, obviously, right? Um, when when I was looking at the book last night, I was thinking about the passage of time. And I was saying, oh my God, that's a 20 year old photograph. Absolutely put the hook into me. Because so I was there on the day, I remember it well. I covered it, I, was, I, slept, in, I slept in a car that night and filed four different editions to the observer because as the death toll went up, as the, the body count rose. And I was looking at that picture last night going, you know, 20 years. Kind of chilling, you know. Yeah, so. Some of this book feels real, like you know, it's, it's only a life past, but it, some of it feels like ancient <coughs> history. You know, it's it's very odd. In fact, I saw my own story on the next page. You know, I, I remember I, I, I couldn't I couldn't I couldn't even remember the headlines. You know, but there are all the other ones. You know, but uh, it's funny how you just think, you forget. You know, and that's a weird thing about about uh, this place. Things move at such a brisk clip. Thank you. Thank God, because if you if, if, if it stayed on our front of our minds all the time, we'd be, <laughs> we'd be traumatised, wouldn't we? Yeah. You've got a question? Yeah. How much would you know about Martin McGuinness as a person, besides his role as a politician, from your own experience? Well, it's, it's what you hear, what you pick up. I mean, you know, and obviously there was all that stuff about, at the time, I did a biography of David Trimble, completely different from this book, because it was a real, you know, 90,000 word biography, you know interviewed dozens of people but you remember things but you pick up things from people who interacted with him and uh, that, that story about you know Jerry Kelly saying that Trimble don't don't get him talking about fly fishing and we'll, we'll get nothing done around this table um, you you pick up things you need to put the human detail in these things you know what's you know I mean here, here's an interesting thought and it's something that struck me writing this book and then thinking back about other... Now, a lot of political bi autobiography here is self-serving, obviously, and, and a lot of it is re rewriting history to a certain extent. But one thing... That, now, maybe there's a good reason for this, but if you look at some of the big political beasts in Britain, they all kept diaries. You know, Tony Benn's diaries compelling read, Thatcher's diaries, you know, some really interesting stuff. Um, the po politicians here don't seem to keep diaries. Now, maybe some of them, maybe there's a good reason not to keep diaries because they could be incriminating, you could end up <laughs> getting, getting yourself into trouble. But I found that fascinating that so far. I, 
I can't think, maybe some, somebody could correct me here, but I can't think of one big political paramilitary figure or whoever who kept a memoir. Or, okay, you'd read a retrospective memoir. I mean, Sean McStay one did one, didn't he? Or, yeah, a long time ago. Long, long time ago. Rory. And Rory did. R- well, Rory probably actually is probably the, was, the, was the most voluminous recorder of, of, a, of his events as, as he saw them. He kept a diary. But I, in, in the North, I can't think of, you know, did Paisley keep a diary? It would have been fascinating to read them. I mean, did, uh, did Robinson, you know, you know I, has he kept a diary? I doubt it, I doubt it very much, you know. You know, um, that to me is a real kind of strange kind of omission, and I would have. I, I wonder why that is. Maybe I'd, I'd like to hear you, your views on that. Why is that? Because you know, I when if you apart from the Rodeo Brody Diaries, which are fascinating, really fascinating, I urge you to read them, get them, get them out of the library or buy them, and it's it's, it's a really interesting book. As is Robert White's book on. Republicanism, Robert White, the American academic, it's a cracking book. Out of the ashes. Out of the ashes. Thanks, Richard. And it's 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 a record of people's memories of being in the Republican movement. It's a very very good book. But generally speaking, you, and especially at the high political echelons, you don't get it, which is odd, you know. You get it in America, obviously. You get it, you know. You get it in Europe to a certain extent. Certainly in Britain, but. For some reason, they don't do it here. I mean, I don't know if Bertie's done his. I don't know. Maybe get it. Maybe he might get himself into trouble with a few uh, notes here and there. But but generally speaking, you don't. And I wonder why that is. Would it be just? Would it be, would it be, would it be the volatility? I would have loved to have read Martin McGuinness. Oh jeez! <laughs> I think that would be a I always I always thought it was just the volatility of because it's like the birth of this new democracy over here, or whatever, which yeah. is going splendidly. But the volatility of it, and maybe. And then sometimes I think maybe they just never thought they'd make it that far, that's or good, get that's to a that. Very good point. You know, would we even how yeah. much progress would we see, and would there even be a point? And then life is so fanatic and fast moving, and oh, right. I have no idea. Or else maybe there's going to be a wee cache of them coming out at some point in the future, and then we will be that'll be interesting. In Thirty years wow. time. And Frank, else over here. I had a question on that question about what they, in McGinnis's case, you're an active revolutionary, you're not keeping diary notes. Mm-hmm. Just could be. Well, you, you can plank them somewhere, I suppose, you know. That <laughs> memoir when you're in the politics, but that's just... Yeah. Nuts. But an observation on that point, but with respect to uh, the question, the picture, the reference to Tom Bennett and the student book, I mean, each... I've gone through the book, it's great, but he's always looking confident, even as that young man, he's probably yeah. 21 of that. Mm-hmm. He leaves school at 15, so he's never... He's not a university student. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, exactly. Richard's apprentice, I think, was probably in the workforce that he'd be working in the background, but... You know, I, I have this own personally, but took, there is a look of confidence in him. Only at the very end, he's very vulnerable and very yeah. sick. Is that those scary pictures of him again? But just there is throughout that thirty years of public life, uh, a confident young man doing to be an older man that has some sense of you know self belief. But I think the pictures show that. that if there's one constant chronology other than aging, he is. Yeah. He is still. Believing in something himself, and that's, that's reflected I think, mm-hmm. in, in the imagery. Confidence, that's, that's a fair, that is a fair point, yeah. And it is a paradox that I'm comparing it to the, the kind of imagery of the Swasson we thought, and yet he was never, did not, didn't have formal university education, but I just thought it was an interesting parallel with it. But you're right, I mean, the confidence thing comes out. But sometimes conflicts produce that, they, they open up the space for people who wouldn't have otherwise rose to the top, you know. Interesting point. Yeah. I got to see a, a documentary last night called The Image I Missed. It was about Arthur and Cake, um, and there was an awful lot of unseen footage within it. Um, it's largely uh, about his relationship with his son, he's also a documentary filmmaker. It's very intimate kind of film. But I came away thinking how much time um, had passed, uh, the different landscapes, the geographies you made reference to in, in your images. But I also can always think of how much time did I want to spend back in that that yeah. era. Um, I'm very interested in how you deal with the recent past. Um, an awful lot of people in your in the photographs would still be alive. Um, can you can you speak a little bit about that? About uh, the responsibility of balance and. Uh... Well, I mean, I did 
didn't shirk from what the IRA did. I mean, obviously, and, and especially in his native Derry, I mentioned Patsy Gillespie and all that in human form, which I think undoubtedly was a war crime. To use civilians as proxy suicide bombers is a war crime. There's no question about that. Um, but, so, I mean, all those things need to be injected in there for balance. It had to be. You could not write a hag hagiography because it just wouldn't be credible, you know? And at the same time, it does acknowledge that journey and the absolute, I think it's fact that without him, that we would not be arriving at this current political settlement for whatever reason, for what, whatever that may be, you know? It certainly isn't a United Ireland. I mean, let's be honest, and I do say that in the book, that was not achieved. A lifelong goal did not happen in his lifetime. And that's, that's a fact, that's, that's, that's undeniable. Um, but it's still a remarkable journey. Uh, in terms of legacy, I mean, I think in general this whole legacy question, I think, you know, all these formal... I think the best way to do legacy is through small exercises. I guess this is a tiny thing, tiny thing compared to the big stuff out there. But, you know, it's, it's as personal my own personal view is it's through history and storytelling and people talking and events like this and people from different backgrounds and traditions coming to places like Fela and being able to talk openly about their views and their experiences and historians investigating the past in an honest way, not in a, in the, the free of propaganda rather than some sort of formal process in which you start playing the blame game and um, start demanding that they go to jail but we don't, you know, we were the goody goodies and you weren't, you know, and uh, I think sort of a much more nuanced intellectual kind of way of looking at the past because, you know, other, I was talking, I was, I was with a journalist last week called Patrick Bishop, right, who um, covered some of the worst conflicts, he covered this place but he covered Bosnia and Lebanon, two places I've been in as well, and uh, we were discussing some of the characters we met in Lebanon, and you know we think some of our politicians have been on journeys. You don't, you would not believe some of the journeys some of these guys have been under. So we were talking about Misha, General Michel Aoun, right? And both of us remember being in hotels in Beirut in 1990, in the cellars, the wine cellars. While Michel Aoun was launching a rocket war, firing missiles into West Beirut from the east. He's a Christian forces general, supplied ironically by Saddam Hussein, right, who hated the Syrians, right? And there were like thousands of rockets. They were, they were actually meeting each other on the Green Line, crashing in together, hundreds of people killed. Uh, Aoun was anti Assad, anti Syria, anti Hezbollah. Today, in the Lebanese parliament, he sits in the pro-Syrian Assad bloc in Parliament. He sits beside Hezbollah and Amal, and won't hear a bad word said against his good friend, Mr. President Assad. Right? Okay. Uh, you've got you've got like other warlords like Samir Gaija who like would wake up in the morning and decide he would shell some Palestinian village for the crack. Right? Literally, because he was in a bad mood, and there'd be twelve or sixteen people killed in one one morning. Right? He's now in the same block, right? All he moves around. I mean, we think we've got people who, old enemies that coalesce and make compromises or, or deals, dirty or otherwise. I mean, it's nothing compared to what goes on in some of these countries, you know? And Bishop and I were laughing about this. We're going, you know, these, these are the kind of stories we need to tell, you know? Right? And for them, they're not hung up in legacy. How could they be? Some of the things they did, you know? Now, you could argue about the morality of that, but when you compare terrible things that happened here, the, the cosmically awful things that happened in a place like that, you know? It's just worth thinking about, you know? When you're talking about journeys, you know? Henry, I was born in uh, August 1971. The week that internment was, was introduced. I have an 18 year old nephew 
who has no concept of the troubles and he has been taught it as history. I wonder maybe in conclusion if you can tell us how you think history will, will judge I think that word at the start, that sentence, the word journey is overused in Hackney, but it comes to Martin McGuinness, there's no other more opposite word. It's a, a necessary journey. Um, would not happen. This, this peace process would, would have been impossible without it. Impossible. And, and that, that's, that's a fairly good judgment of history. You know? You have to be. Now, I, again, as I say, I don't think the, the end game was achieved. But do people, what do people care about? Do they care about peace and a bit of freedom and not being sort of worried about, or, or do they want to go back to those days of endless processions of funerals and, you know, we want, we want to get out of there, you know? No, why, yeah. why do you think people always think the have to resort to violence? You know, I don't. Saying the I don't. Than the sword. And at the end of the day, everybody knows you have to come back to talking. Yeah, I agree you know, with that. I can't understand why people have to take up arms and be revolutionary. Well, at the end of the day, that can't go on. You know, you always come back to talking. Well, that's it's always in most conflicts. Not all, though. I mean, some some don't. I mean, you know, some do end in military victory for one side or the other. But it, it depends, really. You know, I mean. It's interesting that both both McGuinness and David Irving went to Sri Lanka, which has been in the news recently, hasn't mm-hmm. it? Mm-hmm. Certain MP, and they genuinely went out to try and negotiate a peace between the Tamils and the Sinhalese government. Yeah. Unfortunately, they weren't listened to, and in the end, you know, the Sinhalese won, basically by br- the most brutal sort of military oppressive op- operation, you know, and. and you know, although it was certainly on peace, that seems okay, you know, sort of to be their friends, but, um, but, you know, but generally speaking, most conflicts do end like that, they do end in going back to... Discussions? Not, they can, but sometimes they don't, you know, sometimes they don't, sometimes they do end in brutal military victory for one side or other, as happened in Sri Lanka. But. There is an opposite image on page 56. Mm-hmm. And the reason why I'm pointing it out is because there is w- one thing worth remembering as well. This wasn't just, this didn't end just because of negotiations, the bravery of certain politicians. All that's correct, imagination. There was also a secret war, which, let's be frank, the British state won. On page 56, does anybody recognise who that is? Yeah, state knife. I mean, I, I, I spotted that image and realised it was important to, put, to mention it in the book. That's one of the most important agents inside the movement. So he's got the taste of it, you know. So conflicts end, yes, through imagination, negotiation, people taking life life risking chances, but also sometimes there's invisible hands working. Yeah, there's three dimensional chess being played. Mm-hmm. And that's why this character got a mention in the book. Okay. As well. You know? This is a sober reminder that it wasn't just <coughs> you know. If you said it again, what's the point of the picture? It's like, yeah. Well it's 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 Freddy Fred's well, got pieces. Okay, it's one of the few pictures of him, and yeah. it's, a, it's a, a, yet, yet again another funeral. I think it's Larry Marty's funeral, actually, up in North Island, which I remember covering at the time. It was a, it was a pretty fractious few days, that was, to say the least. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, sobering. Sobering image, you know, worth remembering. But overall, a remarkable journey, yeah. And, uh, it's a, a, a book that, you know, again, it's kind of odd, you know, kind of doing it as if it's the end stop, you know. But I would love to, st- I would wonder, is there diaries or are there, you know, probably not. Maybe I'm being naive, but but it is interesting that there's a dearth of them out there. You know? But maybe maybe we're going to get a big surprise one day, somebody's going to produce them. Probably after death, of course, it won't help with the Boston College tapes, debacle as well, so, you know. And that has been really bad for history. I mean, I... 
Um, it's no secret I've written about it, so I'm not letting anything out of the bag. One of the books I wanted to do, one of the projects I was involved in, and I would have been involved with a university in London, a very senior academic who's now a biographer, who's actually Clement Attlee's biographer recently, and another journalist in the Republic goes, we were going to do a parallel project of the security side of things. So all the guys from the IRA and UVF would give their testimonies to Boston, to the Belfast project. We were going to do a parallel one from one of the big universities in England, in, in London. The people who were involved in the security things, very serious stuff, were going to talk to us. And it was all going to be predicated on when I die, you can release this story about me, my agents, who certain incidents, you know, you can imagine the stories they, they, they were telling. And we spoke to them. It, we had preliminary conversations with 25 people across the border, not just up here, across in the Republic. Some of them really illuminating characters in, in, in the Garda, right? And their, their role is underestimated sometimes, right? The day the PSNI won its case in America to seize the Boston material, our project collapsed within about two hours. The phone calls came in, that's it, we're not doing it, it's over. Take my name off that project, you'll get a solicitor's letter. <laughs> I mean, even from friends of people we knew, you know, uh, it's, it's dead in the water. So the whole pursuit of the Boston material, in terms of history, has been very damaging. And talk about legacy. So it's, I think it's, it's inflicted a very severe blow on that whole issue of history and historical truth and it, it's it, I don't I think it down, it's lasting damage I am the librarian of the Lynn Paul Library and I work there quite con I'm there all the time <laughs> uh, well any oral history projects that we do now we have to caveat by saying you cannot tell us anything disclosable really is that right which is you know uh, uh, disappointing yeah and it does mean that that that's full 360 degree history um, may not be captured. Do you think we might be in a better position if we had a Truth and Reconciliation Commission like they had in South Africa? Or? I don't think you can draw any parallels with South Africa, but um, the, only, the only way you're going to get that to work is if you have a general amnesty for everyone. It can't work any other way. If you're demanding X goes to jail, Y doesn't, and then you want everybody to tell the truth, there's no chance. No chance. It's not going to work. Now, can you advocate? Who's going to advocate for a general amnesty? I don't know. Politically, but you know, it seems to me the only way you could do it. But you know, but as I say, I, I didn't know that about it. That's impacted on the limb hole. Now. That's amazing. God, the reverberations. Boston College. Um, well, doesn't mean that we aren't getting fantastic material. Sure. Some of which have been donated over the years. You know? Yes, and that's but, very um, interesting. There's files of, um, and yeah. files of papers you talked about mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah. in terms of your research and yeah. where your archive might go uh, yeah. in the future. But, um, but yes, it, it, it's, uh, it's an interesting challenge. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. How so, interesting is how important um, your project was? Yeah. Naturally. <laughs> and this is the first time I've ever heard of it. Yep. Yep. I wrote, I wrote about it uh, a, a while ago in The Guardian. Uh, you know, a good while ago. No, the linen holes impacted on it too. What other flippant effects has this Boston College had? It's, I don't know. But certainly, in relation to us, I mean, our project died within, within one day. Um, we had to go to we had to go to the college authority the, the, the in London and tell them it's, our participants have gone they're not they've all disappeared. Do you think that's a bit like the third hand of the chest that you were talking about, or if they come in and they scupper the tapes on the Boston College? They knew everybody else was going to shut up. Control of everything because then they can control what comes out and when it comes out and who by. So by <coughs> jeopardising the project. They're controlling any future projects and what comes out and when so they don't want anything coming out without their knowledge. Maybe not as intended consequences, but they must have had a, a guess that it would create a chill factor. Yeah. 
across the board, and that even their own people would, would shut up, even in even even in death, you know, <laughs> which is what they've done. You know? Yep. Yeah. It's it is, it, but it it has had a really negative impact. You know? They've fallen into the third hand's lap. Yeah, well, that, yeah. I mean, well, you got to deconstruct. Yeah. How that they got there's it's, the human stupidity involved in saying we can promise yeah. you this and yeah. the process but the, of court intervention the, after that. But yeah, I mean, we were looking forward to that project. We thought, wow, well, we're going to get some great stories here. But you know, it's going to be an amazing archive, you know. But literally within hours, the phone call started. No, I said no way. I'm not going. To, I'm not being prosecuted. Under, you know, they're going to go after me next. You know, I'm, you know, you kidding? Got it. Got it. 2005. She a con act. You know, I'll be done. You know. In fact, some of them were actually. Ban- One guy rang me from Dublin on a Tesco mobile. Uh, he bought that day, and then he threw it in the Liffey afterwards. Terrified. Yeah, he bought he bought a cheap Tesco mobile and rang me to, to, just simply to tell me I'm not taking part in this project. And, and, and I met him about a year later. Bumped into him in the, uh, outside Trinity, actually, and he was waiting for my daughter. And he said, and I says, what happened to you? And he goes, well, I says, and, and that mobile, don't, don't bother, don't bother ring me on it, because it went straight into the lift. <laughs> yeah, that's how paranoid they got, you know? But, you know. Which is why history gets written by. Well, the, <laughs> By whom, I wonder sometimes. Yes, by whom, exactly. That's why it's important to have professional historians, you know, who are to be able to... Know. Any other questions about the book, or...? Well, I think if we, we can... I hope that was useful. Hope that was useful right? Call it a day, and we'll, you'll hang about for 10 or 15 sure, minutes, yeah, 20 yeah, minutes, yeah. and there's still tea and biscuits, and yep. you can sign a few books, Love to, yeah. chat to some of the people, yeah, yeah. and if anyone's too, too, too... I don't think there's too many shy ones, but if there's anyone shy, they can come up and have a yarn. Certainly, yeah. If that'd be okay with everybody. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Thank thanks, you all for coming. That was really enlightening. Really